Good morning all, Steve Parisi here with IBC Global. Today we've got one of our favorite guests, Scott Witt, president of Witt Actuarial Services. Scott, how are you this morning? Good, how are you, Steve? Sun's shining after all the rain we got this week. I'm I'm loving it. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Definitely. How's it up by you? Um, very nice. Yeah, it's, uh, it's almost the weekend, so hopefully get outside a little bit. Right on, right on. Well, today I've got a good topic. We've got a good topic I wanted to talk about just to build more awareness around you because we've had these podcasts for, uh, for a while now. People have reached out to me um, asking about you, your services, and you've worked with a handful of people and there's been a lot of satisfaction, but just really to provide more transparency around your company, what you do, your niche, your fees, services, we can kind of get into it. This way, anyone listening, as they are trying to weigh out that decision to know, okay, here's exactly what Scott does. Is he a fit for me or not? I think it'll provide some value there. Yeah, I appreciate that because I think there is quite a bit of confusion. I think about you know the, what I do is so rare and, and I think there's this, some have a misperception that you and I are financially connected somehow. And so we, we can, you know, we can dispel that notion over the course of our conversation today. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. We've gotten that a couple of times. We're like, yeah, no, we don't work together. We're just, you know, friends that are mutually aligned and if it works out well, it works out well. <laughs> yeah. So I guess to begin, let's start with what you do. So you are, you're an actuary. I mean, that that's your background, but your firm, you're a fee only insurance advisor. That would be your title, correct? Correct. Yep. I'm an actuary by training and I still maintain my actuarial designations. And there, there is, of course, an actuarial element to almost everything I do on a day to day basis. But yes, I'm a fee only insurance advisor. And perhaps the most important part of that is the fee only aspect. And, you know, there's a lot of confusion um, within the industry when it comes to that. You've got you've got certain um, people in the financial industry that are fee only you have other that are fee based. You've got this word fiduciary that that is thrown around a lot. And so, I mean, those are some those are some points on which I'd like to provide some clarity today, if possible. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, why don't we start with a little bit as far as what you do for a client, and then we can touch on the fees as well, because that's a question everyone always asks. Hey, what are your fees? But first, sure. let's let's go through the service as far as if I come to you. So, if I'm shopping for a cash value life insurance policy, trying to find out if it's designed properly, that's where you, and correct me if I'm wrong, but where you are a fit to say, hey, I can provide advice with my background as an actuary of how to design policies for maximum cash value and how you're compensated is really just per an hourly fee. There's no commissions, no you know kickbacks from any agents you work with because You'll work with whatever agent is on the case, whether it's me, whoever else it might be. But um, it's, well, I'll, I'll let you kind of elaborate because you, you can explain it better than me. <laughs> yeah, so, so that's exactly right. I, I work on an hourly or a project fee basis and my compensation is entirely independent of the insurance decisions that my clients make. So I get paid the same whether they buy insurance or not no matter what company they buy it from, no matter what agent they use. And not only do I have access to individuals like yourself, but I really have access to the entire universe of life insurance products. And and you mentioned specifically a, a cash value accumulation type sale, but that's really just one specific type of situation that I consult on. Really anywhere that life insurance rears its head especially when you're talking about significant premium dollars or significant cash value dollars or even significant death benefit, any of those situations are an opportunity for somebody like myself to add value. And so when you start to have real money at stake, I think it's really important to have an independent second opinion. And my compensation model puts my money where my mouth is. You know, there's a lot of people that say they're independent, they're looking out for your best interest. They might even claim to be a fiduciary but if you follow the money, do they or do they not have an inherent conflict of interest? And I'm one of the few people in the country that can legitimately say that I have no conflicts of interest. It, it makes zero difference to me what my clients choose to do because I'm going to get paid the same one way or the other. And because of that, I can serve them in a true 
fiduciary capacity, not, you know, fiduciary or <laughs> um, cloaking myself in that, that I'm looking out for their best interest. I, I really am obligated to look out for their best interest. And my compensation model is, is set up such that um, it would be silly for me to do otherwise. You know, my business thrives on word of mouth and um, good or bad. And so uh, I, I, every single client, it's critical that I put myself in their shoes and that I give them advice as if I was giving it to myself or to a, a family member. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. No, appreciate that. So in your, your service, I, I kind of want to play the role if I'm considering reaching out to you, if I'm a client, if, if I am looking at a policy with an agent, maybe it's with me, and I'm looking at it to say, okay, it looks all right. Maybe it's set up perfectly. Maybe it's not. I don't know because I'm not in the industry. I'm a consumer. I do something else for a living. I can ask my agent more questions, but their job is really to sell it. I can talk to another agent, but we know how that'll work is to, <laughs> the common insurance agent will they'll sling mud at each other and say, oh, well, do it this way, do it that way, work with me. And you just get caught up in this war as a consumer. Specifically working with you. So if I come to you with a policy, what would that look like a little bit? I say, hey, here is something I'm considering. I'm speaking with an agent or a couple agents. I've got some illustrations. What would you need or, or how would that process work just to kind of start things off? We don't have to go into all the details. Mm -hmm. Sure. And let, let me first draw a distinction. Um, let, let's assume that we're talking about a case where somebody's starting from scratch. There's there's a whole nother family of cases yeah. where somebody has an in-force portfolio of life insurance policies. They've been pitched a, a replacement. And, and so not only would I be analyzing the replacement proposal, but I'd be analyzing the enforced policies. And, and we might want, might want to touch on that later, but, but let's yeah. just assume we're starting from scratch with somebody who has little or no insurance and they're, they're contemplating a purchase or they've been pitched a purchase maybe by multiple agents and they're getting pulled in different directions and they, they don't know who to believe. Um, that's a perfect situation for somebody like me to come in and offer some guidance. And um, I immediately gain their trust because I'm not trying to sell them something. I, I'm, I'm not trying to establish a rapport with them so that two or three hours down the road, they, they trust me implicitly and, and I can sell them something. And, and because they know that, that they don't have to worry about some end destination of, of me doing a bait and switch or, or um, trying to get referrals from them or any other various things that, that many life insurance agents do, it frees them up to talk about their goals and objectives and their personal situation because they know that my interests are truly aligned with theirs. And the better information I collect from them the better job I can do for them giving them advice. So the first thing I do in a situation like that, like that is just step back and make sure we don't get buried in the details right away and, and jump into the proposal. I want to step back and understand what it is they're trying to achieve. How did they get to this point in time? Did they, did they read a book? Have they been, you know, have they been listening to things about be your own banker, infinite banking, bank on yourself, the leap system? Um, other things that are out there. Is, is that how they got to this point? And I, I just want to understand where they're coming from and what their expectations are about what this life insurance policy is going to do for them. And, and that conversation then is really going to dictate the next steps we take. And it, it, it might be just a true cash value optimization situation. But even within that, there's a whole variety of, you know, is your objective to use this as supplemental retirement income? Are you under the impression that you're going to borrow from this repeatedly and buy real estate and and you know think that you're going to pay interest to yourself? Or are you going to leave it untouched and really view it as uh, an emergency source of funds, maybe supplemental long-term care if needed? But if not needed, it's just going to grow uh, in perpetuity and become a generational wealth transfer to to a beneficiary. So those are all different. Those are all different things that come into the conversation. Um, that might lead us to different, um, d down different product paths, different company paths, depending on um, the features that are really important um, to the client. As you know, and, and, and I know this is the only way that you design policies, but I then look to put the best foot forward on every single proposal that the client will see. 
So if, if they haven't already been given an optimal proposal from the agent they're currently working with, we're now at a fork in the road. And I asked the client, do you want me to work with your agent to try to make this illustration better? Or do you want me to bring in somebody new that I already have confidence in, is willing and able to design an optimal policy? And that can go different directions. Sometimes a client feels beholden to an existing agent. They want to give them a chance. Um, and, and sometimes agents are cooperative. Sometimes they're not. You know, Some of them draw a line in the sand defending their original proposal. They don't want to budge. They certainly don't want to give up um, their, a significant portion of their compensation, which they may have been counting on. Um, and, and, and so I, it, it's just impossible to predict. Every, every, every case is different. And the beauty of what I do is it's not a cookie cutter service. It's not something that I can just run, run you through an automated program. I might be able to do something at a high level. And in fact, that's something I'm contemplating in my practice. Is there a, is there a reduced fee sort of streamlined service that I can provide to identify major red flags? But that's probably more on an existing policy than it is um, a new policy. So anyway, that was a really long answer. Um, uh, it, it's something that I really enjoy doing and customizing my analysis and my recommendations for the specific situation. And because there is no one size fits all. And I, I'm sure as a life insurance agent, you know, you, you hear the joke all the time about when, when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And sometimes, <laughs> yeah. or many times, life insurance, uh, becomes that hammer. You know, an agent comes into a sales meeting and like, I don't, I don't know, I don't know what your problem is, but I know the solution is life insurance. And we just need to figure out like how it's going to, how it's going to solve whatever your problems are. And and while I'm a huge, huge fan of, of all types of life insurance, I have a little bit more fair and balanced viewpoint and I'm under no financial pressure or otherwise to recommend life insurance when it's not needed or wanted. Yeah, I agree with that. There's times too in my practice personally where we'll we'll instruct individuals who are eager to get a policy, doesn't make sense yet. Maybe we're paying off debt, whatever it might be, and it may make sense 12 to 24 months. We'll keep in touch with you, but it's just it's not in your best interest. And and I like I, I like that a lot that you can offer that where it's it's kind of that shining light where typically you do get what you just said as far as Hey, welcome to our practice. How much life insurance? You know, this is the best thing ever. Just put all your money in it. It's like, all right, not, not quite. Let's slow down, take a deep breath and analyze things. Um, so to kind of sum that up. So as far as people working with you, the first thing you're going to do is ask them questions, have a conversation, see what their goals are, then analyze the policy, make sure it's set up properly, whether they're brand new, whether they're working with someone, see if you can work with the other agent, but really leave it up to the client to make that choice to keep them as comfortable as possible because it can be a, a sensitive subject sometimes for people from what you mentioned, if they feel obligated to the agent, whatever it might be. It, it um, might be a fam you know, it might be a family member that yeah. has, has mm -hmm. come to them or, or a golfing buddy. Um, let, let me back up a step further. Be, before I even accept an engagement, I have a short exchange. It can be in writing, you know, via email, or it can be a phone call. But I want to make sure that I'm a good fit for the client and the client is a good fit for me. You know, I only want to take on a case where I can make an impactful difference. And so I don't go on the clock right away. I, I, I do a little legwork up front to make sure that the case is a good candidate. And if it's not, you know, I, I might give them a little bit of free advice and, and send them on their way. Um, because not everybody that reaches out to me, in fact, probably a third of the people that reach out to me do not end up engaging me. And I, I could have tried to milk a small engagement out of that, but that's not really, that's not really what interests me. And I'm looking for situations where, <laughs> I mean, I'll just be honest. I'm looking for situations where I'm going to look really good. And yeah. at the end of the engagement, they're going to be happy to send me a check because it was obvious that I earned my money. Correct. Those, those yeah. are the cases that make you feel good as an advisor. Those are the cases that keep your business thriving and growing. If, if you're trying to eke out checks from people that are dissatisfied and, and, 
you're just trying to take on an engagement because you can like that, 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 that's not, that's not a winning business strategy in the long run. Yeah. I love that you said that it reminds me of a, an attorney I just hired personally. I met her through, through some other clients we're working with actually, but she is the best I've ever met. And she does what you just said. I mean, she's selective as far as who they bring on her and her firm, but they're very, very good. And they're going to work with people that, that are a fit where they can look, they look good, they help, but they meet with them first. They don't charge them for that initial consultation to, to kind of interview, see if it's a fit, like what you just said. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, you know, I'm, I, I charge a relatively high amount um, mm -hmm. on an hourly basis, but I, I'm looking for cases where people are going to believe that it's worth it. Yeah, fully agree. Um, so we can get get into that, actually. The last thing I just kind of want to sum up as far as the services that you'll get. So you've got the interview process, analyzing the policies, providing a ton of value there as a non-agent, even though you do hold a life insurance license so you can legally talk about life insurance. I just want to make sure I mention that. But the, um, the planning, I think, is valuable, too. We've had other podcasts on that, but your perspective from an actuarial standpoint to say, hey, I'm considering cash value life insurance, but how does that fit into the picture when I've got a lot of money over here in cash, bonds, stocks, real estate? Like what's the overall impact that this policy will have in my, in my life? I've seen you do that. We've discussed it. You're very good at it. It is something you can offer there as well. It's a more in-depth process. It takes a lot, of, a lot more time, but that is, I would say, a service you offer and you're very good at it. You can touch on that if you'd like, but people are yeah, interested I mean, in that. Mm -hmm. I, do have a, I do have a financial background and I've, I've passed the Series 65 exam. So if I wanted to do so, I could hook up with a registered investment advisor and, and you know, a firm and, and make money that way. But I felt it was important to have a niche and, and not be competing with people who are managing money. And, and once you start managing money, now you have inherent conflicts of interest. And you know even, even fee-only financial advisors, if they're charging on an assets under management basis, they have an inherent conflict of interest when it comes to things like life insurance and annuities because if a client purchases one of those things, it's a pay cut for the advisor. And so, you know, I, I appreciate you bringing that up. I, I do have a broad-based perspective. And, and because I'm independent and because I'm compensated the same no matter what the client does, I can have a conversation with them about their 401k and their bonds and their tax situation and their life insurance portfolio. And I can have that conversation in a manner that frankly isn't possible for somebody that's managing their money or for a life insurance agent because they each have a horse in the race. Um, the, the thing that I would be most analogous to would be a fee-only financial planner that was being compensated on a similar basis to me, that, that was being compensated on an hourly or a project fee basis. They're just coming up with a financial plan or making recommendations, but they don't actually manage the money. And in, in those situations, I think they're the closest to me in terms of removing conflicts of interest. And Lo and behold, guess what? Those advisors, way more receptive to life insurance and annuities than the advisors that are compensated on an assets under management basis or the, you know, the stock brokers that are that they're still getting commissions from transactions that their clients are making. And so I, I, I've always found that to be a very compelling argument for what I do. You know, I've, I've made the joke that if you put me in a room with five financial advisors, I could just start talking about life insurance and annuities and based on their reaction, I could predict with a high degree of accuracy how each of them were compensated in their financial <laughs> practice. And yeah. those that are hourly or project fee or retainer type individuals are much more receptive um, to, the, to an annuitization concept with your money at the, at the back end of life or using life insurance as a, as a multi-purpose or, or GASP, an, an investment vehicle. But those who are compensated on an assets under management basis, buy term invested difference, all other life insurance is terrible. Why would you ever annuitize? I mean, it, it, it is a line in the sand for many advisors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's something I like how you mentioned that you can tell pretty quickly just how they react as far as where they're, what they're doing. 
And I mean, I, I'll tell you another, if you want to be, if you want to, you know, win friends and influence people um, or not, <laughs> it, it, in a room full of financial advisors that are compensated on an assets under management basis and tout themselves as fee only, suggest to them that they have an inherent conflict of interest when it comes to things like life insurance and annuities and uh, those frowns turn or the, the, those smiles turn upside down uh, yeah pretty, pretty quickly get the bo- boxing gloves on yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah let's um let's get into your your hourly basis your hourly, hourly fee because that's the question that sure. everyone's going to ask how much does it cost so i i engage you right we have a, a we connect we have a conversation i say okay you're a fit how much do you charge? So, sure. That's- I, and I, my, my base hourly rate is three fifty, but I can tell you that as of the first of the year, twenty twenty two, it's going to go to four hundred. Um, it might be three ninety five, you know, for marketing purposes, but yeah. um, it's probably <laughs> okay. it's probably just going to be four hundred. I've been at three fifty for um, about a decade, so um, now we've made it through the pandemic, hopefully, and uh, it's it's time for an inflationary bump as, as low as inflation has been. So um, $400 an hour, generally, it doesn't make a lot of sense for me to get involved in a case for less than $1,000, let's say. So if we use my, my, my soon to be $400 billing rate, that would imply a two and a half hour engagement. Um, anything less than that, it's going to really depend on my workflow. If, if I can, if I can work something in and, you know, guide somebody in an hour, if my work will allow that, I'll do it. But if I'm busy and a project isn't complicated or interesting enough for me to, to spend a couple hours on or two or three hours on, I'm probably just going to send the client on their way. Um, Mm -hmm. if yeah, you know, like in order for me to add some value, there's got to be some, there's got to be some, something for me to do. <laughs> I guess right. I'll, I'll just put it that way. Um, yeah. And usually there is. I mean, I. It's very rare that somebody comes to me and 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 I say, you know what, I there's nothing I can do for you here. I can't improve upon that. Your agent has exactly done right by you. Now, if it's somebody that worked with you there's a there's a much much better chance that they're going to be in a really good spot by the time they come to me and and in a situation like that where i might be helping them is with the finer points um choosing between the companies understanding the pros and cons and even if the end result isn't that much different than what they started with they have the peace of mind knowing that they had somebody look over it and provide advice to them that had no vested interest in the outcome of the case. Yeah, I fully agree. And it's it's important for them to understand too that when they come to me, I'm considering the entire universe of possibilities. And so while they may have received some illustrations from you um, from certain companies, there are other companies out there that, that maybe you don't favor or maybe you don't even have access to. And I've always got those in mind. And I think we've talked about this before. Like if you did a Venn diagram, um, I keep using that reference, but I don't don't know how many people actually know what a Venn diagram is. Do you? I'm sure you (laughs) probably do. Yeah. No? Um, Well, that's, that, that, that doesn't bode well for, uh, for my demonstration. (laughs) So a, a, a Venn diagram is a graphical representation of how sets intersect with each other. Mm-hmm. And so if, if, if you if you draw circles on a, on a piece of paper and, and you draw one circle, these are the companies that I like to use for term policies. All right. Then we draw another circle. These are the companies that I like to use for whole life policies. Then we draw another circle. These are the companies that I like to use for variable universal life policies. And you would intersect those circles and then you would write companies in there if if they if they were in all of those categories so if we had one company that i really liked in all three of those categories term whole life and variable universal life they would be in the middle of that you know where the three circles all intersected and they'd be in that little tiny like clover leaf looking thing in the middle yep there are no companies like that there are no companies that are good in every segment and in fact if you did a venn diagram of all the different kind of areas where you can buy life insurance, 
there's very little overlap with any of the segments. And so you're going to have clients that it's not always, I mean, I, I know, I know it's a common thing in your practice, but it's not always about maximizing right. cash value, life insurance purchases. There's a whole other world of life insurance decisions out there. Some people buy life insurance for protection and that might be short term in nature, which we would be term insurance, or they might have a permanent need, which would, would be more of a protection oriented sale than a, an accumulation oriented sale. Um, there's also other, a lot of other spots where life insurance can pop up. My point in all of that is I'm not just looking at the three or four companies that are really good for cash value life insurance that frequently, frequently come up in our cases. Uh, I've got access to the entire universe of companies. And in fact, there's some companies in certain segments of the marketplace that don't even have agents. You buy directly from the company. There's no sales commission. Um, and there are certain types of policies where that makes a lot of sense. Just, you know, I know a lot of your listeners are cash value, are interested in cash value maximization. Those no load policies are not very competitive in that space. You can buy a no load policy and maybe you look good day one coming out of the gate, but some of the other, other underlying fundamentals on the policy are inferior to the other options that we typically discuss. And so even though you won the short term battle, you lose the long-term value war. And my point in all of that is, it's very complicated and there's a lot of different moving pieces. And just because you're really smart in one segment of the marketplace, you can't necessarily apply those lessons to other segments of the marketplace. And so the expertise that I bring to the table covers all of those different segments and allows me to fit the different pieces together for a client and allows me to consider do products in these other areas of the marketplace even make sense or are we should we strictly be focused on a cash value accumulation product so yeah. probably a lot more than you're looking for there gotcha but, uh, no no i i like all the the info so uh, let me ask this then because i know some people that have worked with us have have had complex situations that i'm sure have eaten up a lot of your time and some more know what they want and they're just looking for that second opinion. So just for everyone listening, is there is there anything that you can provide just kind of as a general range to say, hey, if you if you're looking for, you know, max cash value, you've got a good sense of what you look what you're looking for, it might take me, you know, two to three hours, like or or maybe less. But if it's a complex situation where you've got policies that were set up in the past that are not that, you know, they were not efficient, you know, you were sold under, you know, poor expectations or misinformation and you've really got to dig into it. It's going to take time. My question is average time frames. So you've got the hourly rate. So if someone is listening to say, okay, you know, am I going to need 10 hours with them, which could sure. result in four grand or do I need, you know, an hour or two and hey, then it's well worth it. Mm -hmm. So I, I would say the bulk of the cases that, that I've worked on with, your clients, clients who have seen your podcast and have come to me, have ended up between a thousand and two thousand dollars, probably closer to to one thousand. Sure. Much of that is going to depend on the client and the analogy that I always use. If you just want me to tell you what time it is, it's not going to take me nearly as long as if you want me to explain how the watch works. And if, if, if you want to get into how the watch works and have me spend the time either on the phone or in writing going through lots of technical details and, and reasons for my recommendations, I'm happy to do that, but I'm on the clock. And so yeah. I've got clients that are all over the spectrum on that. Some, some people say, you know what, I'm, I'm successful in my own field and it's afforded me the luxury of hiring somebody like you who's an expert in your field. I trust you because of your compensation model and because of, of, of your practice. I don't need to understand all the intricacies. They actually save a little bit of time on my bill. There are others, and you get a lot of these. You get a lot of do-it-yourselfers. I mean, I mean, let's face it. They're they're looking on the internet. They're watching YouTube videos. They're they're trying to get you know. They're trying to do everything they can. Ironically, those individuals often end up using more of my time and spend a little bit more. Um, but maybe they walk away, you know, smarter and, and 
feeling more satisfied in the outcome because they they do understand the intricacies yeah. so well. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I'm like that personally. Like, I, like I want to understand something. I mean, there are some occasions where like, okay, does it increase the bottom line? It's the best. All right, sounds good. Make a decision decision quickly. But I mean, if it's a product that I really want to understand, I mean, I want to know how it works. That's just my personality. Um, and at the same time, like if if someone comes to you and they're looking to put in three hundred thousand dollars per year or heavy dollar amount, then I mean, if it costs two grand, even if it costs eight grand, if it takes a huge amount of your time, but significantly improves that policy performance, short term, long term, everything then it is well worth it. I mean, that's just a, a drop in the bucket at the end of the day, the amount yeah, they'll spend I, with you. I also do calibrate the depth of my analysis for the size of the case. And I'll be upfront with people and say, look, you, you're, only, you're only spending 10 grand a year in premiums. You know, it, it, $1,000 makes some sense. And, and I, can, I, I can calibrate, you know, the depth of my analysis to match that. But a $5,000 analysis wouldn't make sense if, if your premiums are only 10,000. Now, if it's somebody off the street that's coming coming to you or to me with an all base policy and, and the premiums are 10,000, well, I mean, I might be able to save them $8,000 right out of the gate. Um, but usually if, if they've already worked with you or they've kind of, a do-it-yourselfer has kind of already figured out what they want, I'm not sure that the incremental savings, it, I, it, I'm not sure it's gonna be a feel-good story if, yeah. if my fee is that close to the annual premium. But as you get into the more complicated cases and there's more dollars at stake and it might constitute a larger percentage of the person's net worth, now it, it starts to make more sense to, to drill a little deeper and have, an, ha, have a more in-depth analysis. A couple yeah. of caveats I, I want to point out. If, if we've got a situation where we're talking about premium financing or some sort of heavy leveraging, either you know the external leveraging would be premium financing or internal leveraging with with borrowing within the policy, um, th- those can be more complicated. And and sometimes I have clients come to me with some serious misconceptions about the implications of borrowing from a policy and whether that's generating wealth or destroying wealth. And that can take some time to, to work through. So those can be a little bit more complicated. Um, the other thing I will say, and and I know this will this will have a, a hopefully a, a wide uh, range of of audience that's listening in. If you have an existing policy, those situations can be more complicated as well. And if if you come to me with a portfolio of ten policies, ranging you know different companies, different types of plans, different situations, maybe even different insureds, if it's spanning your whole family, that's going to take some time. Uh, if, if you come to me with a single policy to review, that's usually going to be two to three hours. And again, I, I kind of look back at the cash value. You know, once your cash value starts to be upwards of 50 and especially a hundred thousand dollars, it, it makes a ton of sense to spend 1% of your cash value to get advice that's going to last you really for the rest of your life. And you know, contrast that with a financial advisor who might be charging you 100 basis points a year just to try to beat some market, you know, they end up being a closet indexer and they're charging 100 basis points each and every year and half of them don't beat the benchmark anyway. Um, when you come to somebody like me and you spend 100 basis points of your cash value, Let, let's say my engagement was 1,000 and you had a $100,000 cash value, you're, you're set on a different path for the rest of your policy's lifetime. Or maybe you get out of that policy, maybe you didn't realize it was a bad policy until you talked with me, and now we, we get you on a different path, whether it's a non-insurance path, or maybe it's an annuity, or maybe it's a new life insurance policy. I mean, all those options are on the table, but now you're on a, a a permanently altered path. And, and I would argue that the value added proposition there is much greater than for somebody that's just managing your money and, and taking 1% out every year. So yeah. long story short, if, if, if you have an existing cash value of 100,000 or more, it's kind of a no brainer to get that policy reviewed. And, and it's you, you don't need an annual review. 
you may never need another review. You know, it's, it's maybe not the smartest business decision, but I haven't set up my business to be a perpetuity where my clients keep coming back every year. If I do my job right, and if they if they buy a policy and they do it right at the upfront, or we review a policy 10 years later and, and, and we tell them what they need to know, the involvement of somebody like me should be minimal or non-existent for the rest of their life. Maybe if there's a material change in their circumstances, yep. Then, then you come back, but, um, gotcha. It, gotcha. It, it, if I'm doing my job right, it's not an annual checkup kind of business. Yeah. Yeah. That the, thanks for that detail. I mean, a couple situations like that, a premium financing or leveraging policies that uh, I know it takes me and my firm a long time to analyze those, to try and translate them into English to people when they get, they're shown a projection showing, Hey, if you leverage, you can increase the amount of uh, illustrated cash value in this policy when I run the projection very, very attractive. And people just see the bottom line and say, hey, that looks great in that projection, but needing to understand it, have full transparency and awareness around it, that takes time to dig into. And not only does it take time to dig into for someone like you, but then also explaining it in an articulate manner where the client gets it and says, okay, now I see where this could potentially blow up. All right, I want to look at conservative assumptions or something like that. Um, having that you know, additional awareness of what to do, what not to do, what questions to ask so that buyer's remorse or regret does not come in after it's too late. That, that I think is the value right there to get it set up properly so we don't regret it down the road. Yeah, it's a great point. I, I, th I think another important thing to understand is that the illustration is not the product. Like this is not simply an illustration comparison where the best illustration wins because you and I both know there's other types of products out there that we could push that would look better on paper. And if, 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 if the sole objective was to recommend to a client the policy that looks best on paper, there are other types of policies that that you'd be selling other than whole life insurance or, or right. maybe different companies within the whole life insurance marketplace. But the goal isn't to illustrate the best. The goal is to perform the best. And, and that's where, you know, you've got a wealth of experience. I've got a wealth of experience. It's more complicated than just looking to see which illustration is the best. In fact, that's supposed to be a forbidden practice that you're not supposed to sell, to sell life insurance policies on that basis. And it, it, for, for those clients that hire me, I belong to a subscription service that also allows me to get some additional in-depth uh, on, on a policy review. It's Think of it as a Morningstar system that can give anywhere between you know zero stars and five stars to a policy. Um, I incorporate that in my practice. Uh, it, it, it helps reassure some clients um, that that what I'm doing is on point and, and some people like the, the fancy graphs and the pictures and all that. Um, but it, it, it's just another way, uh, another service that I provide to my clients to help them um, get the best possible outcome. And, and one of the things that that review does is it, it, is, it, is it helps assess the viability of the illustrated numbers in the context of historical performance for some of the key factors for the company in question. And so it can raise some red flags. You know, there's this crediting rate of 6%, but when we look at the performance of the general account, it's only 4%. So that doesn't necessarily mean the illustration is trash, but it's a starting point for a conversation. Is there a rational explanation for why a company has consistently been able to deliver a higher crediting rate or dividend interest rate than the general account portfolio. And then that leads you into conversations about, okay, is it, is their whole life insurance line getting subsidized by profits in some other lines of business? Is this a deliberate company strategy or are they artificially propping this up on a short-term basis for competitive reasons? And is the bottom gonna fall out you know, a few years down the road when, when their surplus position dwindles? So there's some high-level conversations and strategic type analysis that occurs when I recommend a policy. It's, it's, it's not as simple as the best illustration wins. I will say that within a given company and a given policy, 
often that exercise is reduced to trying to find the best illustration because usually lowering the agent compensation and improving the early cash values does lead to a better illustration. But amazingly enough, as you, as you and I have observed recently, even that seemingly obvious conclusion is no longer true on illustrations. There are some companies that when you skinny down the agent compensation as far as you can go, and you and I both know that should be an insurmountable head start for a policy, those illustrations from certain companies no longer are the best illustrations that those companies can show. And you can raise the agent compensation a little bit and actually boost the illustrated values. And as you and I, as you and I have discussed, <laughs> yeah. we don't have a lot of confidence that, 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 that that's going to be the reality of the situation. But I, that's just another example that everything is not always as it seems when you look at a, a sales illustration. And you know the old saying, a, a bird in the hand is better than two in the bush. If you can lower agent compensation and get a high early cash value, you've got that in hand. But if you're hoping for a paper promise that only is going to come to fruition 30, 40 years down the road, it remains to be seen how that's going to play out. Yeah. No. And on that point, someone re recently mentioned to me, because he was looking at policies, he's looking at a large amount putting into going into a policy. He said, you know what? As I see these different projections and I see other advisors and agents out there recommend taking less upfront for more cash value long term, he goes, you know, I've, I've seen that for some time now. He's actually in the business, um, but I haven't seen it p actually pan out. I'd much rather take what's guaranteed where I see my money in hand up front and I've seen policies actually deliver instead of something that's non-guaranteed that might happen where I've got to give up a lot of guaranteed for it. I'm not talking about guaranteed cash values, just guaranteed to have the money in the hand versus don't do it because there's that chance you might have more money long term. It's like, hey, we've never seen that chance actually come true. At least I haven't. Um, so that that's my viewpoint on it. The way he said that, I'm like, that's a, a good illustration. And let me just give you one other kind of tricky example. Most policies are compensated on a on a heaped basis, where the bulk of the compensation is received in the first year, and then steps down, maybe even in multiple tiers. But by the time you get to the 10th or 11th year, there may be little or no agent compensation on an ongoing basis. And what that usually results in is a very low first year cash value. And I know a lot of your listeners are very smart and savvy with all these terms. On an all base policy, you often have a first year cash value of zero. Sometimes you can even have a second year cash value of zero in, in, in the right combination. So an all base policy can often have a first year cash value of zero. The bulk of those acquisition expenses are devoted to first year agent compensation. Some companies have wisened up and they levelize the agent compensation. And you might look at a different illustration and even though maybe, it, maybe it's all base, now it shows a first year cash value and maybe even a fairly attractive one that leads many people to conclude that, oh, th this is actually a low commission policy because I've got this high first year cash value. But what they fail to recognize is that that large first year commission really just got spread out over a five or a 10 year period. And if you go and look at, at the 10 year cash value, you still may not be at a break even point because that you've got this heavy commission that's coming in year after year after year, and it just takes forever for the policy to get any traction. So just a cautionary tale for, for, your, for your listeners to not put too much stock in the first year cash value because there are some legitimate reasons why having that value be higher or lower can be good or bad for you down the road. And the danger with do-it-yourselfers is you can learn just enough to be dangerous. And you talk to one source, you think you've got it all figured out, and then you just apply that blindly. And unless you truly, truly are an expert and, and you've got all these wide ranging perspectives and are kind of able to distill that down into to a coherent viewpoint, you might come to exactly the wrong conclusion.
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I agree. You have to know what to look for and be able to identify it quickly. And it takes experience. It takes an expert in that field. That's that's really how it works. And that's the case with any any industry, really. Knowing what to look for. Hey, it looks good on paper, but buyer beware. That kind of stuff. Yeah. And the old, you know, you don't know what you don't know. I mean, that that's the problem when you teach yourself something from scratch. How do you know... <laughs> How do you know when you know enough to proceed? Um, and so I think one way you can articulate the value that I bring to the table is I help clients understand what it is that they don't know. And, and they may not even be aware that they don't know it. And then after I get them up to speed, that gap might be small, it might be large, but there's a there's an information catch up that occurs, um, especially for the clients that want that. Some clients just want to be told what to do, and that's fine as well. But for those clients that are really invested in uh, understanding how the watch is built, um, I'm I'm trying to catch them up to my level of of expertise and experience to the extent that they want to get there. Gotcha, beautiful. Yeah, no, I, I like that because I'm I'm like that myself. <laughs> I don't like that myself. So, no, I really appreciate you going through all of that info. Uh, I know that's definitely valuable for listeners. Any Anything else that, that you wanted to touch on? I know we covered your services, hourly rates, um, really digging into details. Anything you wanted to mention just about your company, how you work with clients and such? Yeah, a couple things. Um, first off, I have a national practice. I think sometimes people are, are under the mistaken impression that they have to meet with me in person or I'm in Wisconsin. They think that they have to, to be in Wisconsin. I have clients all over the nation. And I mean, who really wants to meet face to face with an actuary anyway? So rest assured, you don't have to do that. We can work, we can work remotely. Um, the other thing I want people to understand is that while we spend all of our time here talking about life insurance, I also consult on annuities, long-term care. Um, I can help with pension decisions, you know, some of your listeners might be facing, you know, should I take, should I take a lump sum? Should I take a life only? Um, should I have a joint and survivor percentage? And I, I can help them think through that situation in both a financial and an actuarial context, talking about their health and their financial situation and help them figure out um, what makes the most sense. And I've had a couple interesting cases lately where my clients, we figured out that it makes sense for them to take a single life only pension and then use a little bit of that to purchase a declining death benefit universal life policy to provide um, yeah. protection for the beneficiary. And they're, they're in a much better net position than if they took the joint and survivor option um, with the pension. It rarely works that way, but... I just give that as, a, as one creative example of, of how these different segments of my business can, can weave together. And again, the fact that I'm not selling anything and I'm looking at a, at a top-down viewpoint, I have clients that we, we, the, the conversation seamlessly goes between life insurance, annuities, and long-term care. Like they're, they're trying to figure out how to address certain needs or certain risks. And there are certain situations where any of those products might be appropriate to discuss. And I, I spend a lot of my time saying, no, I'll tell people this is not a good life insurance policy or scheme to get into. This is not a good annuity. Like what, what are you thinking here? If, if this is, if, if this is a tax play that you really think you're making, why not make that tax play over in life insurance where you can avoid taxes entirely rather than just having your taxes deferred. And oftentimes long-term care advice is just a bunch of no's, you know, delivering bad news. Like it's, it, you're still exposed to the risk and the policy is very expensive. And yes, the premiums might go up and I'm, you know, a client comes to me and my premiums have gone up 300%. It's, there's a lot of bad news in, in the long-term care uh, insurance advisory field. But um, in, any, in any event, my, my practice touches on a lot of different insurance related areas. Um, and I, I love working in all of them. So yeah, it's, it's yeah. uh Definitely. It's a fun practice that I have. <laughs> no, I, I love that. And you're you're called in a lot of times, and you have to go into detail on this, for life insurance cases specifically as an expert witness a lot of times, correct? Yeah, I do serve as an expert witness uh, yeah. in, in insurance yeah. litigation. And yeah. um, 
yeah, that's that's another segment of my practice. Um, you know, I, I can I can either be a plaintiff expert or or defendant expert, and there could be cases that allege agent misconduct. You know, maybe a policy was replaced that that somebody feels shouldn't have been replaced, and and we're trying to quantify where that client would have been had they not received bad advice. Um, situations like that. So yeah, I, I mean that that I think just speaks to credibility because to do that well, with the people you're and, and forces you're up against sometimes. I mean you, you got to be you got to be on point and you got to know your stuff. <laughs> that's all. <laughs> well, hopefully that's the idea anyway. Yeah, otherwise it's not going to be fun. <laughs> cool. Well, thanks so much for your time. I think I, I enjoyed this podcast especially, but no, really appreciate your time as always, Scott. Um, for anyone listening, you know, feel free. Uh, contact info for Scott is below. Reach out anytime. Um, if you have any questions, you can always ask us, myself as well. Um, and we'll always, we're happy to set up an introduction anytime. I appreciate that. Th- thanks for your time as always, Steve. Likewise. Likewise. Well, enjoy and we'll talk to you next time. Okay. Sounds good. All right. Thanks. Bye. Hey guys, Steve Parisi here. If you enjoyed the content you just saw, please subscribe, like, and hit the notification bell for future videos. If you'd like more information or to see some custom policies for yourself, feel free to call or email our offices at the contact information below.